Uh, so good afternoon. Last panel, surprise, so many of you still are here. So we are going to talk about Capital Markets Union, which is the new sexy thing in Brussels. And before we start, I'd like to introduce all the panelists. So to my left, it's Lubos Pastor. He's exactly now one of the smartest economic migrants we have. So he lives in Washington. He's a professor at the university. Chicago. What did I say? Washington. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> and uh, he's now also at the central bank's board, advising and consulting the, the bank on all the other issues. Then we also have Mr. Peter Lang. Uh, he is coming from <clears throat> uh, Raiffeisen. He has plenty of experience, nearly 30, 30 years in banking on different positions, and now he's on the management board and he's in charge of the corporate business portfolio, so he knows all these things. Then we have Markus uh, Bayer from uh, Business Europe, which is a body representing all size uh, enterprises in 34 European countries. We would like to start with him then on, uh, on the, all the issues. We also have Mr. Nikolai Koso, who is the head of International Investment Bank which has plenty of rep uh, represents across the whole region in former Soviet Union, also in Europe and globally. She's recent, uh, and the bank recently also opened a branch in Slovakia. Then we have uh, Mr. Michael Bull, who is coming from uh, Vienna Stock Exchange. He's also an experienced guy in the sector. He also knows the, the conditions and the markets in, in Ljubljana, in Prague, in Budapest. So that's why we can also touch the regional issues. And last but not least, we have Karsten Pilat, who is coming from the European Council. For many of you, that's the building where you can see all these prime minister and ministers meeting for the for the summits. And he is leading the he's leading the director general of, on economic uh, affairs and competitiveness issues. So, Capital Markets Union, as it is, as it stands, it's something uh, Juncker Commission uh, designed as an action plan to boost economy and maybe help small and medium enterprises in a, in a way that the European economy, as we all know, is majorly or significantly financed from, from banks or by banks. So the, the design or the aim is to unlock existing capital and fresh capital or maybe existing capital and channel it into the real economy through new channels, so we can discuss how many, like, what are these channels, what are the options, what are the possibilities. Uh, we've heard from Yaron Dijsselbloem yesterday that actually a well-functioning and effective uh, CMU is a precondition to have a resilient and a stronger economic uh, monetary union. Uh, there are three basic uh, words they connect to, to the CMU. They call it simple, transparent, and uh, standardized, which means harmonization. This is going to be a pain in the ass for many countries, as all the issues with harmonization. And the deadline when they want to have all these things in place should be 2019. So let's see about it. Many people complain that this is not ambitious enough. So maybe we'll also touch this, this, this date as well. So let's start with the debate. And maybe with you, please. As you represent all the businesses, like many businesses, what is the reaction? What is the, is there a take up? Is there a demand? So what is the sector thinking about the whole action plan? Well, I mean, yes, does it work? Yeah. I hope so, so first of all, uh, thanks for the invitation. And to start with your question, well, I mean, is it ambitious enough? I mean, I think overall, as far as the substance and the capital markets union is concerned, there's a lot in it. Of course, 2019 is not the day after tomorrow, but I mean, looking at the EU uh, procedures, I mean, of course, we would like to have it earlier, but yeah. overall, we think it's pretty ambitious. Do we need an improvement in capital market union? I mean, you said it. It's very clear. I mean, we, we cannot have a functioning uh, European Monetary Union without factor mobility. And of course, uh, uh, capital is, uh, is key as far as this is concerned. And maybe coming from a more general point of view, talking to businesses, to companies a lot, and uh, analyzing a lot, I mean, why companies do invest in Europe or elsewhere. Of course, there's always a mix, but there's two standalone reasons why companies would, ex would, would, would invest elsewhere. One is cost of energy. And the other one, depending on the market you're in, is, is access to, to finance. So it is a real issue. Uh, we are very positive on the proposal of the European Commission. We will hear later uh, from Carsten Pilat, of course, that the devil is in the detail. 
Of course, this is the beginning uh, of, of, uh, of a European, uh, how to say, of a European strategy. Uh, but it's not very often that we are as satisfied with the content of what the Commission is proposing. So there's a lot in it. Uh, but as I say, this is the beginning. Now it will be about the rapid implementation of many of these aspects, uh, because we have a situation where, of course, the capital markets in Europe are fragmented. Yep. Uh, they're regulated differently. I mean, the, the cross-border uh, capital flows are, in many cases, uh, very much hindered. So what we need to do now is to urgently implement what the European Commission uh, has proposed. And there's a lot of, uh, let's say, encouraging elements in it. I mean, first, I mean, uh, these uh, unnecessary regulatory burdens which hold back investment on infrastructure will be reviewed. This is a very important point for us. Uh, uh, second, uh, we think that uh, having a, a clear and rapid improvement on the prospectus directive is important, uh, especially for granting uh, smaller businesses better access to capital markets. Um, and then, of course, it's also about uh, transparent and standardized securitization uh, of bank loans, which will, uh, as we hope, also make it easier, especially for smaller companies, uh, to exceed uh, finance. And last but not least, not to be too long in the first, in the first take. Last but not least, uh, we think one of the problems we had in recent years was, of course, the cumulative impact of, of a lot of reg regulation. I think it's a very good idea from the Commission to say, okay, let's have a look at this cumulative uh, impact. Let's see uh, what is the real output of these many regulations and directives we have made. And, and let's clearly assess and see what we need to prepare. Okay. A quick follow-up, just a quick, uh, quick question and quick answer. Do you believe it's going to make a difference? Because, okay, it's a nice plan. We had many action plans before. Is this going to make a difference, the companies? Because it's also related with literacy, and maybe companies need to be keen to use that. Well, number one, of course, an action plan by itself doesn't make a difference. But the implementation of the concrete actions. And, and as I say, there is there's a short-term thing on, on securitization, yep. and there's a short-term thing on the prospectus. So this is uh, good first steps. Uh, but of course, it will be about rapid implementation. Uh, but overall, from uh, many things the Commission proposed recently, I would say this is one of the things which definitely go very much in the right direction. Okay, so we touched it with Mr. Pilat, and you know the Brussels animal quite well. So what is your take? How, how fast can we proceed? What are, what's going to be the biggest hurdle and maybe... Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. First, um, for the invitation to this excellent conference here. Um, Martin, this is a sensitive question. How, how, how fast can we progress? I think it's the perfect, because we are currently in the preparation of the next ECOFIN Council. The ECOFIN Council will take place next Tuesday and on the agenda of the ECOFIN, yes. we have the Capital Market Union. I will not bother you with the boring exercise how to prepare a, an ECOFIN Council, but I can share with you, let's say, some observations. One of the things is um, that is agreed in the, European, in, the, in the ECOFIN Council is that they want to express their common political views. 28 member states sitting around a table expressing their views basically is a very complex exercise. It needs a careful preparation. And how we prepare this is basically a simple procedure, it's called council conclusions. So we have committees that prepare a text. The text looks like this here. I will not share the details, they are strictly confidential right now. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's four pages. And this was basically prepared by already two committees, the so-called Financial Service Committee and the uh, EFC, where state secretaries meet. They are basically the deputies of ministers and they had all exchange of views and in both committees, I would say a very awkward procedure, we call this written procedure, where member states express their views in written and the secretariat has then to bring these things together. So the council conclusion itself, the four pages, I do not recommend to you for non-expert to read this text, you will never understand a single word because it's very cryptical how this is phrased, basically and framed, because we need standard vocabularies that are not common to everybody. But I give you basically a thrust of these council conclusions without uh, going into the details. And what we expect, what I'm saying is, I speak under the proviso that ministers agree on, these text, uh, and on, on this text uh, next Tuesday. 
Basically, the main thrust is, among all member states, what Marcos has already mentioned, basically. The way forward is the right one. Um, way forward means the capital market union in principle. One has to acknowledge that this is basically not a new concept, although the label is fine. We have banking union, capital market union. We need even more union. I will not call this migration union, not in this country, but uh, maybe somewhere else. So we would need more union concepts. So in that context, fine to, to speak about a capital market union. But had the commission had the courage to propose the action plan in 2016 instead of 15, they could have celebrated the 50th birthday, the 50th birthday of these proposals, because we have seen so many capital market union proposals. They were not labeled like this in the, in the past 50 years. If you would go back to 66, you would recognize there were many reports realizing the same obstacles which we are fighting still today. So it would not lead automatically to a, a extrapolation, basically. Do we need another 50 years? I hope not to implement things. But I have, let's say, two or three critical remarks on this text, which basically contains the main message. As I said, Marcos has basically outlined the general thrust. Yes, full support by member states. But there are also concerns by member states. And I would outline three different areas where you can see that we are probably at a certain limit and we have probably more difficulties to overcome obstacles in this area. The first area, and you would read this in these council conclusions, is tax policy. Member states are extremely sensitive to touch upon taxes. I mean, you have to keep in mind that one of the obstacles that we have to face in a union of 28 member states are different, 28 different tax regimes. And they all impact more or less on a capital market union because they, have, they are creating obstacles for an integrated capital market. Are member states really keen to remove these obstacles? I would say, let's see and wait. There is no concrete proposal here. And to those who are familiar with tax policy discussions in Brussels, they may uh, look at simply the discussion that's currently ongoing on the FTT, where only 11 out of 28 member states have agreed, let's say, to try to build a common concept. And the discussion is still going on. It's been happening for years right now without any concrete results. So tax policy is a sensitive area. It's mentioned not very obviously in the document, but you can see this from, let's say, in a couple of paragraphs, where there is sensitivity of member states where they do not want basically touch this area. Another area of, let's say, is another difficult area, a very difficult area, is insolvency law, insolvency rules. For those who are familiar with that, they know basically that within the union we have complete different concepts. A couple of member states are even uh, renovating, reforming their insolvency rules and laws, while others are more or less happy with their current system, not doing much. But this is another obstacle to capital market union. And the last of the three issues is basically the issue of, let's assume for a moment we'll get to the capital market union, do we have the right supervisory structure to supervise the capital market union? Because one of the concerns expressed in the document as well is the impact on stability. So I leave these three areas. Two of them have a common feature. It's basically, a very, it goes very down, much down to the question of sovereignty. And this would be my plea to look into this further down the road. We are not there yet. But sooner or later, we have to come to the question, how are we dealing with questions that touch upon national sovereignty? Do we make a full stop there and accept that the capital market union, by definition, will be incomplete? Or do we think, basically, we have to go further? And what does it mean for sovereignty? How do we deal with that? What kind of approach would we need in terms of taxation and in terms of insolvency regime? My final comment, basically, from the perspective of the Council Secretary, or it's probably more or less my personal, my personal observation is, I'm a little bit worried about a, one missing word in this document. But I'm Secretary, I'm a humble uh, uh, a bureaucrat, so I'm not a politician, I do not represent the Member State. But I miss one simple word in this document, this is trust. The word trust does not even appear in this document, and that tells me that there are many experts in this area working on this, but the real lesson of the financial crisis is not really fully incorporated in these documents because it under, basically it incorporates a trust in capital markets at a moment where we have not fully regained trust in banks. 
So how do we come to this conclusion that basically either we assume this by definition trust is there, I'm a little bit worried that it's not really fully incorporated, how we build trust in a capital market union, how we communicate this to ordinary people and not only to experts. And this is the end, I would basically uh, stop here and say, well, despite my recommendation, don't read this uh, council conclusion, probably better do it, then you will see what I mean well, when you leave these to experts, you will see many references to regulations here and there, even regulation numbers are incorporated. The simple word trust building is completely missing here. Maybe Marcos is more right than I uh, am, it's probably something more on the implementation side that we build trust in institutions, meaning even a capital market union, over time. And probably it would not help to have this in the council uh, conclusion right now. But as I said, the starting point then for us in the council really to work hard even on concrete details is then Tuesday. Hopefully this document is fully supported by all ministers because the rule in the council is consensus or unanimity as far as council conclusions is concerned. Political documents have a different, different majority than normal ordinary legislative procedures. Ordinary legislative procedures only need qualified majority. This, documents, this document needs unanimity, and we are hoping for unanimity on Tuesday. Thank you. Just a follow-up, you mentioned trust. How do you want to build it? Because everybody likes or hates Brussels. They don't believe in paper, so how do you build it? What, do you, what is your perception of trust? How do you do it? Um, in my view, one of, the, of the, the main features is language, in my view. I've talked to many, many bankers in the past, and they were wondering about um, uh, the communication, and out there. I, I always sense the same thing. The bankers and capital market union specialists, they have very many self-referential discussions among themselves. And I, I guess you're all the experts of capital market unions in this room here today, but let's say if I would talk to a group of normal people, and I very often deal with visitor groups in the council, I think it's important that we explain why we do what, basically. They look at me with great eyes, and you do not understand the simple word, because I use these Brussels acronyms, I use the special wording as far as the council, the, the decision-making process is concerned, and they often ask simple questions that I wonder myself, oh, I've never thought about this carefully enough to draft this carefully in a language that people can understand. And in my view, trust is legitimacy, and trust is language. And we have to start on this. And it should start with these kind of political documents as well, because I find it a pity, but that's my personal observation, that we do these texts only in a self-referential manner. We hope that other administrations will understand what we are saying here. I would like to make the test with you next Tuesday, coming back and test with you what do you understand from a document, from a text like this. Now, I, I'm, I'm not doubt, I have no doubt on your intellectual capacity, don't misread me. But I, I think this is probably something where there's huge room for maneuver in Brussels in particular, to get out and to reach out with a different way of language and communication. This would be my first recommendation. I would have many others, but okay. I think this is the most important one. Okay, so we can move to banks, for example. We heard a lot of it. So you love regulation, again, new one. So what is the, what is the take of the banks? Because, for example, especially in this region, to make it happen and functioning, CMU cannot go along with, uh, alone without <coughs> banks. So. What is your perception? How can it work? What needs to be done? I think, um, first and foremost, I have to share with you that it's good to be here. This is Tatra Summit. I can sit here one year before Slovakia will take over the EU presidency, and I can sit here as the shareholder representative of Tatra Bank, being a very well-trusted bank in this country, and being a bank that is in many ways uh, leading also within our group of banks in Raiffeisen, being innovative, being goal-getters, going ahead, being ambitious. And for me, it's a, now listening to what was said, it kind of felt good that such a complicated matter we discuss here in Slovakia. For us in our group, our bank in Slovakia, Tatra Banka, very often was a little bit our laboratory. When there was a new idea, they come here, they come forward, we try it out, and we see how the test balloons fly, and then we take it somewhere else. And learn and try and so on. On the other hand, let's be realistic. If you look at the correlation between how well capitalized is a stock exchange and uh, what is in it maybe through a change in regulation, you take Europe as a whole, it has about 60% of GDP, 
uh, which is in stock exchange, versus the United States, where it is double. And within Europe, you have countries like the UK, that is above 100%, and you have countries like Slovakia, where it is below 10%. So it is all nice, and whatever uh, we can agree on here, it will have an impact, and by essence, as a bank, we can only be very positive. But we also must be realistic how relevant it is, when, for which country. But from a banker's perspective, the the world is relatively simple. We are, we are standing in the real economy with our real customers. We are serving more than 800,000 legal entities, most of them small enterprises. They are, they are there and they want to do their business. And if I look at the economic environment, unfortunately still it is relatively weak. We have very advantageous macroeconomic uh, effects. We have very low energy cost, thanks to the low oil price. We have a beneficial uh, circumstances for the exports of Europe into the dollar area, thanks to the relatively weak euro against the dollar. And still, we are just making 1% GDP growth. So imagine we would not have this positive aspect. So how can we stimulate growth for the real economy? This must be our question. And this is how can we make sure that our companies are growing, that they go forward, that they have new ideas, that they have faith. And for this, capital in itself is good. And now look at the disparity. There is a lot of capital which in principle is available, that is looking for investment. Everybody who is a banker or who is a customer is saying, I don't get anything for my deposit. Yeah? Why don't you pay me more of my deposit if I give you my money? And then they look for alternative investments. And if you take the region of Central and Eastern Europe, you see, to a large extent, relatively small countries, relatively small portfolios. And then how can you mobilize that? How can you pool that? How can you facilitate cross-border uh, structures in securitization and pooling of receivables and so on and so forth. And in this aspect, as it was said, the intention of the capital market union is very, very good. I think it has all the ingredients, if it would be implemented as thought, to boost the cooperation and the economic environment within Europe. But if even the expert says uh, the paper is in no known language, uh, and it needs anonymous decisions, then this is underlying my frustration because one of my most frustrating days is when I spend a day in Brussels because I just miss this common language between the people who in all good intention make regulations and try to bring on paper rules and procedures how we can support and boost the economy, all what we want to do together, with a man like me, who is more coming from, the, from standing in the world, talking to customers, trying to steer a group, and then we don't find together easy. Yeah? And here, if I hear that at the end of the day we must come forward with a unified tax regime, with a unified insolvency regulation, with, the, with a unified supervision, I mean, this is far, far away. And that means that it is a long road until we can achieve that. And in this aspect, I fully agree with Markus that 2019 is an ambitious timeline if really that should be the effect uh, to, to make it happen, because that needs a lot of concessions on the national level uh, to achieve this. Okay, so if you take it, okay, let's assume you are a small and medium enterprise you need or you want to find a new alternative way to, to financing and it's a long, uh, long road ahead with like the overall umbrella of CMU, what would you do in a short run, let's say in two, two years? As, two a small, as a small enterprise, he will do nothing different than what he does now. He goes in the next branch, he talks to his friendly banker in his own language and he says what is his financing need. And he should get this somehow through his bank. If now the bank is granting him a loan straightforward or not, then the bank in the second stage 
can bundle that, can structure that, can make a securitization out of that, and through this mobilize the balance sheet. And instead of simplifying, giving 100 loans to 100 SE companies, by having a well-functioning securitization procedure, you can give 200 loans to 200 companies. But the customer-facing side must be very simple. I mean, I can only say for Austria, for example, 90% of the SE companies have less than 15 employees. And on the top of this company is somebody who is a good carpenter, a good painter, a good tailor, but he's definitely not an actual engineering. So we have to keep the focus for these people on their businesses, and all financial service providers then must be the intermediaries and facilitators, but not to try to make bankers or capital market specialists out of these people. That would be a total nuisance. So we must make sure that this intermediation works well. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think the role the banks can have is to speak up on behalf of their customers and try to make things practical. Well, that brings me to Mr. Pastor. When you look at the region, especially Slovakia, for example, what is the, the problem is literacy, as we just heard, of the investors. So what can be done in this, in this area and uh, what else can be done, especially in Slovakia, because banks have limitations, etc. What about pension funds and where do you see all these benefits for, for, let's say, the V4 region or maybe in general? Right, so Slovakia <coughs> doesn't really have capital markets uh, to As speak we know. of. We have a little bit of trading on our local exchange, but most of it is government bonds and uh, a li tiny little bit corporate bonds, stocks, almost negligible. You mentioned that the ratio of the stock market capitalization to GDP in Slovakia was less than 10%. It, it is pretty much at the bottom of the OECD. It's below that of several African countries. So um, we don't really have much in terms of capital markets. However, that need not be a problem. Many people talk about there being different levels of development in capital markets across Europe and how that could be problematic. I'm not so sure, because once you have a single market, which is the objective here, to have a single market to which any firm can go and issue capital, any investor can go and, and invest, it doesn't really matter what the, the local market conditions are. So um, I, I don't think the, the, I think Slovakia can benefit tremendously from from the capital markets union. In fact, I want to come back to, to that point. I completely agree with the view expressed earlier that this is a great thing. I think the capital markets union is one of the best things to have come out of the of the European Commission. Uh, it'll be it, European markets are underdeveloped, not only relative to the United States, um, which they are. They are about half the size of the U.S. equity market, about one third if you look at corporate bonds, about one fifth if you look at venture capital, even though the size of the economy is about the same. But, but the, you know, the stock market is smaller than in Australia or China, if you look at it as a fraction of GDP. So they are underdeveloped, and we would benefit tremendously from more highly developed capital markets. Um, individuals would benefit. They would, be, they would get access to better investment opportunities, a better risk-return trade-off lower fees on investment products, because in a single market there's more competition than in any local market. So huge advantages for individuals, households. Um, firms would benefit because they would get access to an alternative source of financing. You know, when banks are failing, as they sort of have been in, in the recent crisis, you can go somewhere else for capital. You can go to capital markets. Um, the firm cost of capital would likely be lower in an environment where banks are competing with capital markets. And the society as a whole would benefit from more developed capital markets. Uh, we would have a system more resilient, uh, that's, that's less vulnerable to a banking crisis. See, part of the reason why Europe has been in a crisis for so long, unlike the United States, is that the U.S. has more developed capital markets. And uh, if banks are not doing well, well, the other, the other part of the financial sector picks up the slack. In Europe, we only have the banking sector, really, so there is no other half that could pick up the slack when, when banks are not doing very well. So huge potential advantages from having more developed capital markets. Now, the, I, I've heard here a view has been expressed that this, this plan is ambitious, and uh, 
While, while I agree that the plan is ambitious in terms of its ultimate objective, I'm not sure that the specific action plan that has been laid out uh, just a few weeks ago is all that ambitious. I mean, um, it's fairly modest, I think, these things that we're doing. Standardizing securitization, a good thing, no question. Simplifying a prospectus, good thing. Reversing some recent harmful regulation, solvency too, a good thing. But these are all relatively small steps. These are all good things, but, but small. These are, these, are, these are baby steps in the right direction. Um, that's the way I would, I would look at this. And this is in an environment where there are major headwinds to capital markets. So at the same time that we're making these, these baby steps forward, there are other things that are sort of blowing against us. There are, there's a low interest rate environment that is not conducive to, to capital markets, including pension funds that you've mentioned. And moreover, there are other actions uh, that are coming from the top that are, that are going against the development of capital markets. So let me go back to the European Commission. Four years ago, the European Commission uh, proposed a, a financial transactions tax in Europe. And right now, there are 11 of the 28 countries in the EU that are supporting the financial transactions tax, including Slovakia, including Germany, France, Italy, um, and we'll see. I mean, this could actually happen. See, the financial transactions tax, if it happens, will reduce liquidity in capital markets, will li reduce liquidity in what are already illiquid markets. The financial transactions tax is, is the best thing you can do if your goal is to kill capital markets. So we, ha we have the Commission here, on, on the one hand, pushing forward the capital markets union, which I think is a wonderful thing, and that's helping, that's strengthening capital markets. And on the other hand, pushing for the financial transactions tax, which I believe is weakening capital markets. It's a little bit like saying, we want to promote football. We want all Europeans to play football. And by the way, every time you kick the ball, you pay one euro. So I'm not even sure what the net effect of, of this is. I think if we continue taking these baby steps forward, but, but we actually enact the financial transactions tax, we might end up behind uh, where, where we were a few years ago. Okay, so you will like suggest to kill the FTT. Maybe we can try to slip it into the conclusions for Tuesday. There you go. Can you put uh, it on the agenda, uh, please? <laughs> Let's see. I'll ask my, uh, I can ask the minister. Uh, when we touched, for example, the stock exchange, so we can maybe get the perspective from Vienna Stock Exchange, what, in your perspective, are the greatest challenges to the EMU, uh, uh, EMU Capital Markets Union, uh, and uh, what will be the starting position of Vienna Stock Exchange in, in this whole process? Well, I, I couldn't agree more with everything which has been said so far. And uh, the financial transaction tax as the counteractive uh, measure which is right now still under discussion. I do hope uh, that uh, most of the people actually already have uh, ticked it off. Uh, but it's something that's like one of those uh, <clears throat> one of those ghosts like on Halloween, they're popping up again every once in a while. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot bury them. Uh, they, are, they are living like zombies. Uh, anyhow, I, I, this, this is something which, 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 is, which is definitely a problem. Now, many things have been touched on especially also by Karsten, uh, what, we, what we would need actually on the harmonization side. I think there are many, many things which are uh, stepping stones towards a capital markets union. Um, but your second part of the question to me has been, has been touching on wh where are we coming from? What, what, is, what is the, the current status on the Vienna Stock Exchange? Uh, and I think this is uh, more or less uh, a proxy for most of the countries here in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, we are all living on a backbone which is made of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. So especially for those small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, the capital market union is definitely a very, very positive uh, endeavor, a good step forward, a vision to work on. Uh, because, uh, and I want now not to touch too much on the, on the other things, like the harmonization which we need on the taxation side, uh, and maybe frustrations which might come on the way, uh, we need definitely also harmonization on the company law side, on the insolvency law side, on, on, on many, many things actually to move that forward. Um, and there are maybe there's two points I would like to make. The one has been kind of half mentioned, the other one uh, I would like to, to, to elaborate a little bit more maybe. Uh, the first one is that 
what, whatever we, we, we need uh, in going forward is now not only a strong commitment from the European Union institutions on that, and including, and I don't see much to, 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 uh, enough of that currently, is really going out also to all the member states uh, in these kind of formats or other formats uh, and, and market that idea. I mean, I've heard Commissioner Hill uh, in, in, in London and it, it, it's a great thing if he starts saying the first, first thing he wants to do is cut down 30% of regulation which we have because it's just a burden, it's just not helping the market. Good first step, but we need to go out and explain also your language uh, topic. We need to go out and explain what it is all about because we do not know only need to, to, uh, to have this commitment on the European institutions level, we do need to have the commitment on each and every of the 28 EU member states. And we do not only need to them actually also act in the local, in the local environment as a supporter to all the initiatives which might come out of this, and there is going to be a lot of them, but we also need uh, them to strictly refrain from any other actions which are actually counteracting. The financial transaction tax would be one of those things. And Austria is, by the way, also holding up the flag, um, which, uh, which is uh, really coming top down and, 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 and the other way around. Uh, and looking into uh, the uh, also very current uh, situations on a political landscape in, in, in Europe, uh, is not making me very positive on looking ahead uh, because there are so many local and nationalistic interests popping up uh, over the last months and years again, uh, which are, as I said, are dampening my enthusiasm that we, we will be able to achieve that. Uh, another topic which has not yet been mentioned, um, which also plays into why are the US markets so much bigger, why are they so much more developed on the equity side, uh, is definitely uh, the European history. In many of our countries, people have been have been used to putting their money into savings books and that's it. They have not been uh, raised uh, as investing into the equity capital markets. So there is definitely something where we need uh, also a broad campaign, both on the European and on the, on the local uh, levels, uh, on bringing uh, more, uh, more information and knowledge uh, in, a, in, a, in a broad campaign on financial literacy. This is definitely something which, which we're missing currently. We, we do a lot what we can do as a small exchange within our country, but we need much, much more of that. Uh, it's also something about language. It's also about something making people feel more comfortable. Whenever I sit on an airplane next to a US citizen, he does not know who I am. Within 10 minutes, he's going to talk about stocks and the, portf <laughs> and, 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 and the portfolio he is running. This is, this is something which is, I mean, if, if, you, if you own stocks, if I, if I ask my ministers uh, in, in Austria uh, and they tell me, oh, why, by the way, I'm talking to the stock exchange guy now uh, and we, we start with some small talk and they say, well, I, I, I've been owning some stock lately uh, and, uh, you know, we always have to, to, to tell everybody to, to the highest uh, authorities what, how our, our, uh, our wealth is made out of and, and all of a sudden I was aware that I was the only one who was owning stock within the whole government. So, of course, I immediately sold it. And I said, are you crazy? You have to stand up and say, yes, of course, I do own Austrian stocks or stocks at all because I am supporting the Austrian industry. I am supporting jobs. I am supporting growth. So, if we don't get it into the minds of the politicians, and if we do not actually get this whole concept of, uh, of equity financing uh, on a really broad basis from young to old, from all kind of, of stakeholders within the market, uh, we're probably not going to succeed. But here I think also the Capital Markets Union is a brilliant vehicle to touch that sector as well. Because at the end of the day, once we, we count that, and then if you look again into, into the US, those people there are simply, and I think it has something to do with owning stocks because it's the first way of ownership, uh, entrepreneurship. It might change in the long run the minds of Europeans, of young Europeans becoming more entrepreneur, entrepreneurial thinking into the next and, the, and, and probably the, the, the next but one uh, generation. I think this is, if we do it right, this would be an, an incredible achievement, which we will of course not see tomorrow, which we cannot value enough uh, for, for, for the future of Europe. Okay, that sounds good. Before we move on, I would like to ask Mr. Koso, because the bank is, has plenty of experience with capital markets, so what is your experience as a bank? And you touch also issuance of the debt, and you also do, as, as far as I recall, domestic bond placement, so if you can please touch that little issue as well and explain how it works and what is the experience. 
Thank you very much. It's great pleasure to attend the Tatra Summit and a great honor to address this audience. I will uh, share with you rather practical aspects. Well, I, I run IFI, which is one of the oldest in Europe, but reshaped within the last three years and uh, combines nine v very diverse countries. Five EU members, Slovak Republic, Czech Republic, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, Russian Federation, Vietnam, Mongolia, and, and Cuba. And we work on every market, and the problems we, we see are very much the same, I should say. Though they, they have different sharpness. Uh, well, I think very major point in, a, in every discussion, and in discussion about CMU, should be what we are aiming at. Well, at present, I should say that uh, the banks should be held to restore their function to uh, help sustainable growth of national economies. What we are having uh, in practice, banks are more and more pressurized by stiffer and stiffer rules and regulations, by national regulators, supranational regulation, Basel Committee, and uh, if that tendency sustains, that would mean that at the end of the day they will be cornered to a situation in which they will only be able to buy AAA bonds and uh, lend money to A-rated uh, entities. And uh, this is obviously not uh, the situation which we should uh, uh, strive for. In that sense, I think that uh, more focus probably should be made on uh, anti-fraud and uh, money laundering and uh, non-transparency operations by the bank. And obviously, things which are stipulated in the CMU are very helpful. Are very helpful, uh, for example, it was very interesting for me to listen to the discussion about SMEs and securitization of portfolio, uh, if the standards are uh, all over the same, it will obviously help. Because now SME is uh, going down in portfolios of all major banks. And uh, for example, two years ago, we made a quiz on the, um, among leadership of uh, our nine countries. What would you like to see as one of the prime aspects of our um, credit portfolio? The reply all over these diverse countries was, we would like to support SME. We would like to make emphasis on uh, support of SMEs as a pivot for stability in the societies and uh, um, uh, employment. Uh, and uh, that was everywhere the same, from Vietnam to Slovak Republic. Now about uh, capital market. Yesterday we had a very interesting discussion about the need for uh, the need for um, germanization of, of rules and uh, laws. For example, as, as you rightly said, within the last year, we uh, tried to issue domestic bonds in our European Union country. And we, uh, up till now, we, we succeeded in three uh, bond issues. One in Russia, where re regulation is a little bit different. I can tell a few words about it. One in Slovak Republic, one in Romania. In Slovak Republic, that was last October, 50 million bond, uh, three-year uh, maturity bond. In, in Romania, it was uh, 111 million lei, just a few weeks ago. And that was one of the biggest, uh, largest issue. By